If you'll take out your message notes, welcome to week seven of the miracle of mercy. Uh, I want us to focus on showing mercy to your family. Now, how many of you agree that sometimes that's the hardest place? I mean, we're, we're more often forgiving of strangers. We act, not, you know, you could be yelling at somebody in your house and the phone ring and you go, hello? <laughs> what just happened? Like you couldn't control it with your kids or your spouse or somebody else, and then all of a sudden you pick up the phone, man, you instantly go nicey, nicey. And sometimes, I don't know if this bugs you, it really bothers me. Sometimes I'm the most unmerciful to the people I love the most. That grieves me. It's just not right. We cut other people slack all the time. And we often are hardest on our own kids, our own spouse, our own parents, brothers, sisters, relatives, uh, in, in our family system. It's like, well, because we belong together, well then you don't get any grace. You, you, don't, you don't get any mercy. Uh, the sad fact is it's often the hardest place to show mercy is in the home. And a lot of us could identify with David. There at the top of your outline, Psalm 101 verse two. Lord, I wanna live a blameless life, but how I need your help, Lord, especially in my own home where I long to act like I should. That's what I want us to look at this weekend. And I wanna begin with a little quiz. How merciful are you really? You know, you think, oh, I'm just a very loving person. I am a great, loving person. All right, let's just do a little quiz, all right? When my spouse or my sibling or another family member, could be a brother, sister, parent, or any, you know, just a crazy uncle, whatever. When somebody in my family, number one, gets some details wrong while telling a story, do I, A, interrupt them and correct them publicly, or B, say nothing and let it go knowing I've done the same. No cheating. <laughs> Check one of those, not what you'd like, but what really happens in your life. Are you merciful? Do you interrupt them and correct them publicly, or do you say nothing, let it go, knowing you've done the same thing? Okay, how about this one? Uh, when my spouse, or siblings, uh, or some other family member, maybe children, whatever, keep making the same mistakes over and over. Do I, number one, become irritated and angry at them or graciously forgive them and pray for them? Hmm. Some of us are two for two on this one. All right, number three. When my spouse or a sibling or some other family member is getting more attention than I think they deserve, do I, A, feel resentful and feel the need to bring them down a notch? A little sibling rivalry there or whatever. Or do I celebrate with them? Do I celebrate with them? Are you merciful or are you unmerciful? When somebody in your family is getting a little bit more attention than you are, okay? How about number four? When my spouse or a sibling or another family member says or do, does something that I don't understand, they do it and I, I don't know why they did it, do I A, assume they have the best motivation for doing it, or B, question their motivation or, and think the worst? Hmm, how merciful am I with my family? We often assume the best about other people and assume the worst about the people we live with. Okay, how about this last question? Am I more polite with strangers or with my own family? All right, now that you're properly in your place, Let's start the sermon that you really need badly right now, okay? Now for weeks, we've been talking about that mercy is actually just love in action. It was the very first fill-in last week when Pastor Buddy was teaching. We've been saying this over and over. Mercy is love, it's just love in action. And so, since mercy is love in action, whatever is true about love is also true about mercy. Whatever are the characteristics of love are also the characteristics of mercy. Whatever the, are the marks of real love are actually the marks of mercy. And so that gives us a lot of good material. We can go to the great chapter on love in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where in that chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, four to eight, 
it gives us the 15 marks of real love. These 15 marks of real love are also the 15 marks of mercy. So let me just read it to you. It's there on, on your outline. Here's what real love is. Real love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love is not boastful or proud. Love is not rude. So anytime I'm rude, I'm, I'm not being loving. Love is not self-seeking. It's not a me first attitude. Love is not irritable or, or easily angered. It, it's, it lets things slide. Love keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil. But love, real love, rejoices with the truth. Now love is always supportive. Love always trusts. Love is always hopeful. Love always perseveres. And love never, never gives up. Love never fails, it never ends. These are the 15 marks of love, they're also the 15 marks of mercy. So what we're gonna look at real quickly, and I'm just kind of up here to MC this and show a few scriptures, I want us to look at four ways to show mercy at home. And what I'm gonna do is set up each of these four stories by uh, different moms in our church. So you might write these down. Uh, of these 15 different uh, categories of what is real love, which are the marks of mercy. I just chose four of them. I just chose four. We could cover all of them, but we're just gonna look at four today. And, and the first one is this. I show mercy at home to my spouse, my husband, my wife, to my kids, to my brothers, sisters, parents, whatever. I, I, I show mercy at home, number one, by overlooking irritations and offenses. By overlooking irritations and offenses. You know, a lot of marriages and a lot of families are buried with little digs. And we just get irritable and we get, we, we get offended all the time by anything and everything. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, love, which is also mercy, love is mercy in action, uh, mercy is love in action, love is not irritable or it is not easily angered. Now, anger is probably the most misunderstood and mismanaged emotion of all emotions. Uh, anger is not necessarily a sin. You need to understand it. Even God gets angry and the Bible says God does not sin. But there's a difference between righteous anger and unrighteous anger. There's a difference between selfish anger and there's a difference between anger out of love. Anger actually is a God-given capacity. Uh, God gives you the ability. When you see injustice in the world, you should get angry. When you see bigotry and racism, you should get angry. When you see uh, unfairness, you should get angry. If you see little children being abused or women raped, you should get angry. Anger is often an expression of love. But the wrong kind of anger is when you get angry because you have been simply hurt yourself and uh, you have to learn to control it. If you never got angry, you'd just be a vegetable. It's not anger that's wrong. It's long-term anger holding on to anger which turns into bitterness and resentment. But managed anger is actually an asset. Now love is not irritable or easily angered. Uh, the problem is, is that we often will cover up our anger because maybe we're not exploders. You see, there's two kinds of inappropriate expressions of anger. You can blow up or you can clam up. There, there are skunks and there are turtles. In life, skunks always marry turtles. Skunks, when they get angry, you know it. You can smell it. They just stink up the place. <laughs> Turtles, when they get angry, pull back into a shell and hide and hurl. And both of those are inappropriate responses. Now, the Bible's very specific about the, the cost of anger, that anger causes arguments, anger causes mistakes, anger causes foolish things. Proverbs 17, verse eight tells us this, love forgets mistakes, nagging about them separates even close friends. And the Bible says in Proverbs 19, verse 11, it is to your glory to overlook an offense. I want you to circle that verse. It is to your glory to overlook an offense. Love or mercy overlooks irritations. Love and mercy overlooks offenses. It is to your glory to overlook offense. I refuse to get offended. I'm just not gonna make a big deal about it. And so when you start to get angry in your marriage or in your family, you need to ask, why am I angry? 
You need to ask, what do I really want and how can I get it? Because blowing up rarely is the best way. I think the message paraphrase of 1 Thessalonians 5.15 is pretty clear. It says this, be careful that when you get on each other's nerves, you don't snap at each other. Look for the best in each other and always do your best to bring it out. We should just make this the memory verse for the year, okay? Because if we did that, there would be very few divorces if we just be careful when you get on each other's nerves. You don't snap at each other. Look for the best in each other and always do your best to bring it out. I want you to hear our first mom. Uh, would you give a warm welcome to Katie Wynn? Well, hello. So nice, you guys are so warm. <laughs> um, my name is Katie Wynn, and today I'm going to talk about what God has taught me about overlooking irritations and offenses in my marriage. So um, I'll never forget about three years ago, I locked myself in my bedroom with my Bible, and I was looking for a verse, any verse that would tell me it was okay for me to get a divorce. And I was bartering with God. I knew that the Bible said God hates divorce, but I was desperate and I was hopeless. And so I was asking God questions like, well, what if my husband never talks to me? Or what if when he does talk to me, he talks to me, he just says something mean? Uh, what if he doesn't meet my emotional needs? What about the fact that we both don't believe in Christ? There's gotta be an out for me here, God. After an hour of searching through the Bible, I couldn't find an out. And so I dropped to my knees and I said, God, help me. I don't know what to do. Fix my marriage. In that moment, I felt peace. And it's really hard to explain, but I just knew that everything was gonna be okay. When I finally surrendered things to God, I knew that he was gonna handle it and that he was gonna show me what I needed to do to make things better. And I started by spending every spare second in the Word because I know that's how God talks to us. And as I did, he started showing me the actions that I needed to take to make my marriage better. The mercy I showed to my husband was allowing God to change me. Instead of focusing on all the things that my husband was doing wrong, I had to look at the things that I was doing in reaction to his offenses. The Lord corrected my delivery of words. He knocked down walls of resentment. There were so many walls of resentment in our marriage and God just knocked those down and just gave me a softened heart for my husband. And he calmed my waves of rage and anger. Pastor Rick was talking about anger and I know that emotion well. And it got ugly in my house. It got real ugly because I was not responding in love to my husband. And when God taught me to respond in love and control my actions, I started seeing that in my husband. So my actions started to be mirrored in my husband. When I got the word that Pastor Rick wanted me to talk about showing mercy in marriage, I immediately assumed that my husband would not be okay with this. And um, lo and behold, when I sat him down, I took, took him out to lunch and said, hey, guess what? Um, Pastor Rick wants me to talk about our marriage in front of the whole church. Would that be okay? <laughs> And um, I was really scared that he wouldn't want us to like air our dirty laundry. And um, he actually suggested, yeah, tell our story. But the one suggestion he had was, make sure they know that we're not done yet. Like make sure they know that we haven't figured it all out. It shouldn't be that kind of a talk. And you know, that's the beauty of it. Like God doesn't ask us to figure it all out. He just asks us to take one step at a time and to follow his lead, and as we do, he blesses that. I stand here today still married because my husband had the mercy to forgive my ugliness and because I had the mercy to forgive his. But I stand here happily married today because God was merciful when I cried out to him to fix the mess that we'd made of our marriage. Look guys, mercy's hard. 
you know, Pastor Rick was just talking about how it requires overlooking irritations and it requires overlooking offenses. And, and I had to do a ton of that. And, you know, really so did my husband. Um, but it requires taking the first step. So mercy is love in action. When I wanted the yelling to stop in my household, I had to stop yelling. And when I wanted a more affectionate marriage, I had to be affectionate. When I wanted kinder words, I had to speak kind words to my husband first. I had to decide that my relationship with my husband was more important than being right. It was more important than my opinion, and it was more important than correcting my husband. It's a hard one, right, ladies? Yeah. But God's promises in his word are true, and we can do all things through him, even show mercy, because he's the one that gives us the strength to do it. We just have to ask him for that strength. If I can leave you with just one big idea today, it would be this. God is a God of mercy, and God is a God of redemption. If you want to improve your marriage or even just any relationship, you have to stop trying to be right and you have to start doing right, which is to humbly accept God's mercy for yourself and then humbly offer that mercy to the person in your life that's causing those irritations and offenses to you. If you do that, you will experience the miracle of mercy in your marriage. Thank you. You know, as Katie was talking, it occurred to me, we should applaud the four husbands of these women who encouraged them to get up here and talk about their families. Let's hear it for the guys, all right? All right. Let's look at a second way. Uh, looking at these marks of mercy in the family, we can show mercy, number two, to our family members by being kind when they don't deserve it, but they need it. We can, we can show mercy to our family members when we are kind to them, uh, even when they don't deserve it, but when they need it. Now, every family, and I'm not just talking about your nuclear family of uh, you know, husband, wife, uh, kids, or, or whatever, I'm talking about uh, you know, your extended family. Uh, in every family, uh, there are four kinds of what I call VDPs, or very draining people. <laughs> Don't look at them right now, you know who they are, but uh, you know, be cool, okay? Uh, there are difficult people, everybody agree with that? And, every, and everybody's got relatives that are just difficult, hard to get along with, hard to work with, little crazy makers, maybe, maybe a little immature or irresponsible, and, Maybe have some you know, personal defects and they don't know it. Uh, those are difficult people. Uh, there are demanding people. Uh, we all know relatives that are pushy, that are demanding, that are insistent, they're stubborn, uh, they're, they're self-centered, they can only see their way. And, uh, and that's a very draining person. Uh, they're per, you know, perfectionistic. They're, they're disappointing people. That's a third kind. Uh, disappointing people are people who let you down. Uh, they fail you. Maybe they make a promise and break it over and over and over. They're, they, uh, they're disloyal to you. Maybe you know, they're not loyal to you. Uh, so there are difficult, they're demanding, they're uh, disappointing, and then there are destructive people. Uh, we, we live in a very broken world, and there are destructive people who hurt you. Some of you had parents, I'm sorry, who hurt you. Um, and they're, they're dangerous, they're, they're debilitating, they're double dealing, they, they, they can even be hateful. How do you do mercy with people like that? In, in your family, in your home. 1 Corinthians 13, four and seven says this. Love is patient, love is kind, and love is always supportive. How can I always be supportive to people who don't deserve it but need it? Uh, how, how can I be more patient? Well, the Bible says this, Proverbs 19, a man's wisdom gives him patience. The more you understand someone, the more patient you'll be with them. When you're not patient with somebody, it's because you don't understand them. You know, we always look at how far people have to go. We don't look at how far they've already come. 
if you knew their background, you might go, well, good night. They're doing a pretty good job considering who their parents were or the situation they grew up in or the situation. And when you, when you know people's background, when you know what makes them tick, you know that hurt people hurt people. The people who are hurtful are people who are hurting others all the time, are people who've been hurt themselves. And so the Bible says your wisdom gives you patience. Now, the Bible also says in Proverbs 3, 27, whenever you are able, do good to people who need help. Now, circle the word need. It says do good to people who need help. It doesn't say do good to people who deserve help. You don't deserve all the help God gives you. I don't deserve all the help God gives me or that other people give me. I don't even deserve that. So let's just get over this. You only help people when they deserve it. You help people when they're in need. And when they're out bleeding on the side of the road and you come up like the, the Good Samaritan we looked at in one of the early weeks of our small group material, you don't stop and say, do you deserve for me to help you? You, you just help them. You don't ask their religion, you don't ask their nationality, you don't ask their, uh, you know, their economic status, you just help them. You don't say, are you here legally? You don't say, uh, uh, did, you, did you cause this problem yourself? You don't, you don't, none of those questions really matter. You just help somebody who's hurting. That's called mercy. And the Bible says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be uh, shown mercy. So one of the ways we show mercy is by being kind to people when they've not been kind to you. They don't deserve your kindness. They haven't been kind to you, uh, but they need it. You know, I researched all the reasons for being kind. I, I don't go through the whole list, but we talked about this in one of the early sessions in a small group, that because God is kind to you, because kindness makes you happy, kindness is an act of worship, uh, kindness makes you attractive. Did you know that? The Bible says, kindness makes a man attractive, Proverbs 19, 22. So forget the Botox and just be nice, okay? <laughs> and you'll, you'll be a whole lot more attractive if you, you do that. Kindness makes other people want to be kind to you. And the Bible also says that God blesses kindness and he will repay you with kindness if you are kind to other people. You say, Rick, I, I get it. I should be kind to people. But what about these family members who just, they've never been kind to me? But the big idea is, what do you do when people aren't kind to you? You still be kind to them. There are all kinds of benefits in scripture about this. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, don't be hateful to people just because they are hateful to you. We're gonna talk about this in a future week. Uh, rather, be good to each other and to everyone else. Um, I, I want you to hear uh, Patricia Moore's story. Would you give her a warm welcome? Hi, my name is Patricia Moore, and Pastor Rick has asked me to share what I'm learning about how mercy is kind to people when they are least deserve it. I grew up in a home in a military family, living in multiple states and abroad with two alcoholic parents, where there was no love shown, no kindness expressed. Instead of feeling valued, I, I experienced, I did not experience uh, both mental and physical abuse. My mother and I never had a warm mother-daughter relationship as I grew up. Looking back, I wonder if that was because my mom was raised by her aunt who did not know how to demonstrate love either and seemed to have a lack of feeling. When eight years ago, my stepfather passed away in Florida, which left my mother alone. But mom stayed in Florida for another year until it became obvious that she could not take care of herself. My adopted brother was not capable of caring for her either. But because of the painful experience in my youth, I did not want to bring her to live with my family here in California. So my mom went to live with my sister in New York City. 
But it soon became obvious that my sister, who had experienced all the same hurts and rejections that I did growing up, never intended to take care of our mother. Instead, she wanted to get even with mom for all the years of hurt that she had experienced. So my sister basically ignored our mother and neglected caring for her. One day, I received a phone call from my cousin, who lived near my mom and sister on Long Island. And she told me that my, my mom was not being taken care of and was losing a lot of weight. My husband said, we have to bring her to California to take care of her. <sighs> but, back, <laughs> but back in my mind, I was thinking, this is not a lovable person that I wanted back in my life. But we made the merciful choice to be kind to someone who had not been very, who had been unkind to me. When my, my mom arrived in California, I knew immediately that she needed physical, dental, and eye examinations. So I began the task of uh, making doctor appointments. Honestly, from the day she arrived, I was never my plan to take care of her long term. I saw it was emergency that I saw it was emergency help. My husband and I had downsized three times, and we were enjoying being empty nesters. But to shorten the story, fast forward six years. Of course, we're still caring for my mom. We're supposed, we're supported and sustained her through two broken hips. Each time, right before hubby and I, uh, would be leaving on a mission trip. But God enabled us to both care for my mom and enable us to fulfill our mission trip commitments. About a year and a half ago, my mother had a mild stroke, which has rapidly advanced her Alzheimer's condition. We continued to care for her during my second bout with breast cancer a year ago. And even while I was going through chemotherapy and radiation treatments, in this series, several times, Pastor Rick has defined mercy as undeserved forgiveness and unearned kindness. It is not a feeling. It is a choice to be kind, even to people who have never been kind to you. That's not easy. <laughs> now you might uh, expect that my kindness towards my mother would have softened her heart, and maybe even given her the ability to show love back. But with my aging mom's uh, deteriorating mental and physical health, she is not able to love back. No mercy, so mercy is not so dependent on the other person's response to it. I choose to continue to show kindness and love to her because it is the right thing to do. And although I've never received the love I needed from her, I am grateful that she gave birth to me and that I am alive because of her. So at least I can honor her for that. I cannot sugarcoat this. Mercy is often difficult and inconvenient. I have admitted many times that I believe that God has sent her to me because I did not want to take care of her and I needed to learn the lesson of mercy. And you know what? Revenge and retaliation against those who hurt you never makes you happy. I don't know who my story is intended for but I would tell you this, the pathway to peace is through the miracle of mercy. Thank you.
You know, Patricia, when I was sitting there and listening to that, Patricia used a phrase. She said, when my stepfather died, it left my mother alone. And I was just thinking about all of the widows in our church and how statistically wives outlast their husbands. That's a known fact. And they will often live 20 years or longer uh, than, than their husbands. And uh, that brought a kind of an embarrassing, painful moment to me back to mine. Uh, last fall, uh, Kay and I were having a discussion and, and I was complaining about you know all my aches and pains and, and she said, you know, if you don't take care of your health, you're gonna die before me. I'm embarrassed to say this, but in my mind I thought, and, and what's wrong with that? <laughs> you know, it's like, sounds good to me, I was like, I, 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 I don't want to be around here if you're not here, okay? Uh, to live in the world grieving as a widower and, and uh, you know, and, and you know, that was honestly, I have to be honest with you, that's what I thought. Sounds good to me if I die first. Um, but the more I thought about it, I thought how selfish that was. How self-centered that was. How unmerciful it was to my wife. Saying, oh, well, I don't really care about what you have to do after I'm dead and what you'll have to put up with without me. And, uh, I, I, you know, I began to think about, I saw what both Kay and I went through when we lost a son. And I saw what grief did to her then, and I thought, I don't want her going through that again. I don't want her losing a son and then losing a husband. And, and, and so I had to repent. And I actually uh, told her, I said, you know what, I, I've gotten healthy many different times in life. But I said, my motivation is changing on this. And I said, I'm not doing, I've never really cared what I look like. Obviously, I don't wear a suit, you know, and don't, I'm not a style maven. I'm, I'm a hunk of burning love, but I, I'm not, <laughs> I, I'm, you know, it's not like, forget it. We're going the long direction. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, next testimony, all right. Uh, but, you know, I, 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 the truth is, uh, it was quite selfish of me, and I, I made a commitment and said, I'm, I'm going to get healthy to outlast my wife because I don't want her going through that grief again. Did you know that statistics say 97% of all dads, of all fathers, do not take care of their health? 97%. Now let me contrast that. We started the Daniel plan here at Saddleback Church, and it was, uh, it, a lot of people got involved, but... Right now, about 80% of the people doing the Daniel plan are women. The guys all dropped out. So I'm gonna go, oh great, I'm gonna pastor church with fit moms and flabby dads. <laughs> this is not a good thing. This is not a good thing. So you need to man up on this. Now, here's a third area uh, that we can show mercy, and that is by letting go of past hurts. You cannot live close to anybody without getting hurt. One of the reasons some people uh, never get in a loving relationship is because they're afraid of being hurt again. A and you're gonna be hurt. But a marriage, a great marriage, is just a union of two great forgivers. And you gotta learn to let go. You gotta let go of past hurts. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, love keeps no record of wrongs. In other words, write this down. That's all I'm going to say about it. Don't repeat it. Delete it. Okay? When some, you get hurt by somebody in your family, don't repeat it. Delete it. Love keeps no record of wrongs. You don't rehearse it in your mind. You don't keep bringing it back up as a relational weapon. You don't tell other people about it. That's gossip. You've got to let it go. The Bible says this. Love is not rude. Love does not demand its own way. Love is not irritable, touchy. It does not hold grudges. Circle that. Does not hold grudges. And by the way, it's interesting that rudeness and grudges are go together because rude people are really reacting to past hurts. As I said earlier, hurt people hurt people. I, I want you to hear a, a dramatic uh, story of this. Would you give a warm welcome to Rebecca Thatcher? Oh my, hi. <laughs> My name's Rebecca Thatcher, and Pastor Rick has asked me to share a difficult lesson I've had to learn 
how mercy teaches us to let go of the way people have hurt me. And also the importance of teaching our kids how important it is to show mercy to everyone. Now the way the Lord led me to teach mercy to one of, was one of the most difficult and painful processes of my life. I can honestly say that it's probably the area where God has worked most on my heart since I chose to follow Jesus. In 2008, my world completely fell apart when I discovered my husband was having an affair. At the time, we had four daughters under the age of five. <sighs> to say that I was hurt deeply and angry was an understatement. I'm not gonna lie at the time. I absolutely hated the other woman for what she'd done to my family. The affair wound up breaking up my marriage and left me a single parent with four tiny daughters. What kept the pain going after the divorce was my ex-husband slowly but surely introduced this new girlfriend to my daughters. There were some times that I thought I would actually go nuts from frustration and anger. How could he do this? And how dare this woman have a relationship with my babies? I'm fairly sure I just didn't stop crying for an entire year as I adjusted to this new normal. Then four years ago, the Lord brought an amazing man of faith and integrity into my life and to that of my daughters. It was really hard to trust again. I had been holding on to pain and I had been holding on to hurt. But with God's mercy, I began to let go. And I, sorry, sorry. Four years ago, God met, brought a man of faith and integrity into my life and into the life of my daughters. It was so hard to trust again. I'd been holding on to so much hurt. With, within a year, even having a really hard time trusting, I became this man's wife. I gained a stepson, and he gained four stepdaughters. <laughs> With this new marriage, um, it was really helpful to us during the engagement um, to walk through uh, classes that were offered by Saddleback's Step Family Ministry. We felt confident going into our new family dynamic. We were totally prepared but nothing could have prepared me truly for daily life as a stepmother. I didn't understand what a challenge it would be to parent a child that wasn't my own. We know that 70% of all step families end in divorce within the first two years, and I can see why. Step family dynamics are incredibly difficult. Blending two family cultures peaceably is nearly impossible without Christ right at the center and without an amazing support system. Like our church family. <laughs> we couldn't have done it without our church family. We had this support system, but even with rock solid faith, it was really rough in the beginning. And just when I thought things were gonna settle down, shortly after I married my husband, my ex-husband married the other woman. Now that's messy. <laughs> she would become the stepmom of my daughters. But you know, my Heavenly Father had been preparing me for this incredibly confusing time by making me a step-parent first. God truly transformed my heart with his mercy by helping me to see the girl's stepmother through eyes of mercy and grace instead of judgment and hatred. I was able to see her in a completely different light. As I walk through my own personal difficulties, trying to figure out just how I fit into my stepson's heart and into his life, I was now able to see this woman completely differently. Step parent is often said to be a thankless job, because it is. And my ex-husband, um, his wife, isn't just co-parenting one stepchild like me. She's co-parenting four girls. So when I see her sitting in the rain at my daughter's track meet for hours, yes, 
I'm gonna text her and I'm gonna thank her. That's letting go of past hurts. With eyes of mercy, I can see and appreciate what she does for my girls, no matter how unreceptive they might be to that. I want her to know it. The girls can't always understand why I choose to champion someone who I'm supposed to detest, someone they often struggle to relate to, but I know they hear me. Do I still get frustrated with our co-parenting situation? Yep. I want us to have a healthy family dynamic because that's what's best for our girls. But in the meantime, the Lord is busy sanctifying me and helping me to practice mercy when every fiber of my old self wants to do exactly the opposite. I know it's what God wants me to do. And I also know that it's setting an example of mercy for my girls who will face hurts in their own lives. I don't want them to get stuck in bitterness and in resentment any more than I was. I pray my example will inspire them to do the same one day. In closing, I don't know who's hurt you. I don't know how they've hurt you, but I do know the antidote is mercy. I hope you'll try it. Thank you. One of the great joys of my life was baptizing um, Rebecca and her husband and their five kids together right out here, uh, all at the same time. And we put them all under the water at the same time, of seven in that family at one time. I did have a little help, but I am in pretty good shape now, so I just. <laughs> okay, number four. The last way, and I want us to get right to our story, is we show mercy by believing God is working in the lives of others. The way you show mercy to your family is to believe that God is working in your husband's life, in your wife's life, in your children's life. And believing that and trusting and hoping and praying and be believing. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 13, love always trusts. Lo and who's it trust? Not just people, but trust in God. Love is always hopeful. Love perseveres through whatever comes. And, and it, it just stays positive no matter what is thrown at it. It just keeps on going, it keeps on going. Now, this issue of how much you trust, how much you hope, how much you believe can be measured by one thing, how much you pray. If you pray a lot, you're trusting a lot. If you pray a little, you're trusting a little. If you don't pray at all, you're not trusting at all. You're depending on yourself. And that's why the Bible says in Psalm 28, Lord, hear my prayer for mercy when I call to you for help, when I lift my hands toward your most holy place. Prayer and mercy go together because love always trusts. Mercy is always hopeful and it perseveres through whatever comes. I want you to hear Carol Pekaitis' story. Would you give her a warm welcome? Hi, my name is Carol Picatus, and Pastor Rick has asked me to talk about what I'm learning about the connection between prayer and mercy and between faith and mercy. In the fall of 2009, God started me on a journey of mercy when my youngest child, Nathan, was diagnosed with stage four cancer at age 11. It was, of course, an incredibly difficult time facing the vast unknowns that a disease of that magnitude can bring and also facing the horrible treatment that he had to endure for three years as a young boy. It was truly a family crisis. My family and I had absolutely no way of knowing what the future would be like for Nathan or for us. We were forced to learn how to rely on God's mercy and grace, not just on a day-by-day -day basis, but often on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. The Bible says love always trusts always believes and is always hopeful. So I had confidence that my child would be healed. I just didn't know if it would be on earth or in heaven. Faith in God's mercy is comforting when you know the future. 
As I turned to God to receive his overflowing grace and mercy, I was given emotional resources I did not have on my own, and I was able to pour out mercy on my very ill son and our two other kids who are deeply stressed by their brother's illness. Through this very difficult time, God taught me a different aspect of showing mercy that has been priceless to me and might surprise you. When we typically think of mercy, we think of doing kind things for others in tangible ways. You see these visible acts of mercies, mercy, excuse me. And of course, I did many of these during Nate's battle for survival. I would make his favorite foods and let him eat in his room. I would distract him from his pain and nausea by watching movies or playing games with him. I'd take him fun places as often as he was able to go so we could share some fun and laughter. There were also endless doctor visits. I'd take him to the ER in the middle of the night. I would advocate and do anything I could do to help him get better. These were all visible acts of mercy. But I believe the most profound way God taught me to show mercy was to pray for Nate. There was really very little I could do for his physical battle with cancer. I could not make his extreme nausea, pain, and fatigue go away. I could not get rid of the disease. I could not make his body fight infection. However, because of the mercy of Jesus, as it says in Hebrews 4.16, I could come boldly to the throne of our gracious and merciful God by praying for him. There, our entire family could receive God's mercy, and we could find the grace and strength to help us where we needed it as a family. Just think about the power of this act of mercy. I could call upon the Lord of the universe, who's also the Prince of Peace, and ask him to do things for Nate and to show mercy to Nate in ways that were far more powerful than mine or any doctor. I could ask the comforter to bring his comfort in a real and tangible way to my very sick son. I could ask in prayer for God to fulfill his promise of four, uh, Philippians 4.13, which says, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And I could remind myself and Nate that God has promised over and over to never leave or forsake us in our hour of need. Yes, I learned that praying in faith for my family, trusting God, believing in his goodness, hoping in prayer, and standing on the promises through prayer was likely the most powerful act of mercy I could do for my child in pain. I could believe James 1.5 where it says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. I then pray for wisdom, for the best ways to, note, to show mercy, and God would give it to me and to our medical team. Most important of all, and as hard as it was to do this, through praying in faith, I was able to, to release my son in prayer to the loving God who gave him to us. His name Nathan, after all, means God has given. So I align my will for my son with the will of God by praying, your kingdom come, your will be done. And I was willing to trust God's mercy regardless of the outcome. I don't know why some prayers are answered the way we want and others are not. I just know God tells us to believe and to pray. In this particular case, we learned God's will for Nate was to recover from his cancer. And today, he's a senior in high school on his way to college in the fall. <laughs> Thank you. But even if the outcome had been different, my prayers for my child in pain were acts of mercy, and I have no intention of stopping them. You know, sometimes we treat prayer as a last resort rather than our first choice in showing mercy. In times of tragedy or fe fearful circumstances, we often hear people say, well, all we can do now is pray, <laughs> as if that's the last straw or option at showing mercy. But through this ordeal, I have learned that praying is the best thing we can do in a crisis, in a tragic loss, or even in ordinary daily circumstances. In closing, if you are not praying for your kids all the time or your spouse, you're missing out on your greatest influence for doing good in their lives and the most powerful act of mercy you can do. I hope you will make it a priority. God bless you.
Four different moms, four very different crises in the family, but the same solution. Cast yourself on the mercy of God. I don't know what crisis you're going through in your marriage right now. I don't know what crisis you're going through in your family or even just in your personal life, but the antidote is always the same. Cast yourself on the mercy of God. Last verse on your outline, Lamentation chapter three, verse 20 to 23. Jeremiah had gone through a major crisis and he says this, I will never forget, I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Yet, I still dare to hope. I still dare to hope. When I remember this, the unfailing love of the Lord never ends. By his mercies, we have been kept from complete destruction. Great is his faithfulness. And his mercies begin afresh each day. We've talked about four ways to show mercy in your family. If you have a hard time showing mercy in your family, you've forgotten how much mercy God has shown you. And I close with this. The four things that God wants you to do in your family, he already does them with you. He does every one of these with you. God overlooks and forgives your offenses by his mercy. God is kind to you when you don't deserve it, but you need it. God wipes out and forgets all your past sins. He lets it go, puts it in the deepest part of the ocean, wipes it out, washes it clean when you trust Christ. And God is working in your life even when you don't know it. Let's bow our heads. Father, before we can show mercy, we have to receive it. And so today we ask you to show your mercy to us. If you've never said, Jesus Christ, show me your mercy, say that right now. Say, God, I don't understand it all, but as much as I know how, I wanna open my life to your mercy and love. Say, please come into my life. Make yourself real to me. I wanna get to know you. I need your power to be merciful to other people. And I humbly ask this in your name, amen.